Amin Barrett, five and a half months ago, the 21st of April. Cautiously, taking care with every step, Amin Barrett crept quietly through the trees towards her target. Wouldn't think of them as a man. Couldn't think of them as anything more than an enemy. An obstacle. A problem that needed solving. She kept herself numb. This wasn't the time for emotions. Instincts were her only ally. She had a job to do, but could she do it? To kill would be crossing a line into territory from which there was no return. Well, tough shit. There was no other choice. That was the position she'd landed herself in. She was reaping what she'd sown. Bounty hunters were nothing more than scum. Even worse than the Queen's Guard, because they didn't do what they did out of a misguided sense of duty, or a blind loyalty to the Crown. No. They just wanted to line their pockets by any means necessary. Amin was at a crossroads, and death was inevitable. The only question was whose blood she wanted on her hands. In truth, she couldn't live with herself knowing that her actions had cost innocent people their lives. So that was the end of it. The bounty hunter had to go. The angry red glow of the hunter's fire cast long shadows as they lay in the darkness. Now or never. Treading lightly as she went, Amin's fingers twitched towards her knife, gripping it so tightly that it hurt. The hunter shifted and she froze. Had he noticed her? No. Switching positions. Do it now, before it's too late. Swiftly closing the distance, Amin prepared to strike, but an explosion of movement caught her by surprise. The hunter was up and barreling towards her. No time to move. The violence of the collision sent her reeling backwards, desperately searching for purchase and not finding any. The air was forced from her lungs as she slammed into the ground. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Why couldn't she get anything right? The hunter towered above her menacingly, and cold fury rolled off him in waves. So this was it. This scruffy, wild-looking bastard with his matted hair and scraggly beard was going to be the one to take her in. Hate ignited. For him. For herself. For that self-righteous prick Theodoric and everything that he and his masters stood for. You aren't even half as stealthy as you think you are, stranger. Now state your intentions before I see to it that you never creep up on anybody again. The hunter growled in a voice so hard it could have cut through stone. Now Amin wasn't so sure he was going to take her in. Would he kill her? An image of Celeste flared to life in her mind. No. Screw that. She wasn't going to die on her back like a frightened animal. Fuck. You, she snarled as she leapt to her feet. Even though the hate burned through her like magma, even though she would happily fight this man until the bitter bloody end, she had to accept she wasn't a warrior. This might not be a fight she could win, and right now she couldn't afford to lose. There was too much on the line. Fight or flight? It's simple, just pick one, I mean. She wrestled with the decision. But in the end, she chose self-preservation. Muscles coiled. She prepared to run, but something stopped her in her tracks. Doubt crept in. There was something wrong with this picture. The man just didn't look right, and her gut was screaming that she had this all wrong. If you're a bounty hunter, you're not as inept as the rest, but you definitely don't look like one. What are you? Some kind of wild man? Five and a half months ago, the 23rd of April. Grief and relief were hurling rocks at each other, and Amin was caught in the crossfire, torn between the two, swinging back and forth like a pendulum as she lay there in the dark, long after Evander had fallen into a deep sleep. Grief for the sister that she missed so much. 
whose memory she had abused and disrespected with her lies, who deserved far more than to be used as an emotional crowbar. It disgusted me that the day had come so close. She had almost allowed Evander to walk into Lockbury under false pretenses. The lie had come frighteningly easy that night by the lake. Evander had been nothing more than a dangerously earnest stranger. Amin had crept up on him with fatal intentions, and how had he reacted? By offering her safety and food. A voice in her mind had whispered that he would help, and so she'd drawn him in with a half-truth. But what did that make her? A liar. A manipulator. A cold, calculating, selfish coward who was willing to put an innocent life on the line, and for what? To help her rescue the other innocent lives that she'd endangered with her reckless convictions. She was every bit as morally bankrupt as the people she claimed to hate. The guilt, shame and self-loathing had been overwhelming as they'd stood outside of Lockbury. Amin had been taken aback by Evander's horrified reaction to the town. The fight between fear and determination written all over his face. Her conscience had won right at the last second, just before it was too late. The confession had burst out of her as if the words were afraid she might recapture them. She'd seen the ice-cold rage hardening in his slate grey eyes and the clenching of his fists. For a split second she'd wondered if he might lash out, and she would have understood if he had. She felt that she deserved it. After all, what was one more beating if it made up for the deceit? Evander hadn't needed retribution, though. Instead, he'd listened to what she had to say and still chosen to help. Amin had found it so hard to understand why he'd given her a second chance. She knew for a fact that if the roles had been reversed, she wouldn't have done the same thing. That was where the relief came in. As she'd waited in that clearing, she'd been so sure she'd gotten him killed. Hated herself for it. This hadn't been his fight. He'd had no skin in the game. The moment he'd stepped out of those trees had hit her like a punch to the face, and she'd been filled with gratitude. Nobody had died. But that wasn't down to her, and she knew it. Without Evander, the entire thing would have gone to shit and there was no way she would have walked out of there with her life. That wasn't something she was going to forget any time soon. Four months ago, the 3rd of May. Evander was struggling for breath, deathly pale and drenched in sweat. The sound of him thrashing about had woken Amin, and now she wasn't sure what to do. Indecision had frozen her in place. What was going on? Should she say something? Do something? Evander, she called softly, but he didn't seem to register it. Moving over to place a hand on his arm, she was forced to leap back again as he struck out at her. She was sure he was going to attack, but as he looked at her, his eyes seemed to focus. Sitting up, he rubbed a tired hand across his face before releasing a long breath. I'm sorry, he croaked. I thought, I didn't realise it was you. It's okay, she assured him, but he shook his head. No, it's not. I've been having these dreams for months now, and I'd like to say that I'm getting used to them, but it's pretty clear that I'd be lying. I just wish they'd stop. I mean, wasn't sure what to say. The haunted look in Evander's eyes told her something bad had happened. Something awful. But heart to hearts had never been her strong suit, and this was uncharted territory. Despite everything, the two of them were still strangers, even if it didn't feel that way. Would it be overstepping to ask if he wanted to talk about it? The last thing she wanted was to make him feel obligated, but she didn't want to seem uncaring either. You can tell me. I'll listen but only if you want to, she said gently. A silence fell, and she watched his jaw move as if he were chewing his words, 
it was clear that he was struggling with himself. After opening his mouth, closing it again and wavering for a few seconds, he blew out another long breath. I don't even know where to start, I mean. It's insane, I know it is. We come from completely different worlds and it's going to sound like nonsense. Like the rumblings of a madman. Whatever it is, I promise I'll listen. But if you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. Amin was sure he wasn't going to say anything. And she didn't blame him. Not one bit. It was none of her business. It came out of nowhere in the end. Like he couldn't stop himself. And once he started, the words poured out of him. Amin listened with a mounting sense of horror. And when he was done... She sat in dumbstruck silence. It was impossible to meet his gaze, and her eyes were fixed on the cave floor as she traced patterns with her index finger. Words were such empty things. What could she possibly say in response to the story he'd just told her? I'm sorry for your loss. That didn't do it justice, didn't even come close. Amin's life had been ripped apart when Celeste had died, and she'd never been the same. But what Avanda had been through? That was unimaginable. As much as she hated what was being done to Lockbury, she couldn't bear the thought of returning to find it burned to the ground. The idea of losing everyone that she'd ever known in an instant was beyond understanding. Too much for her to grasp. How had he clung to his sanity through all of that? I can't. This was impossible. How could she communicate the way she felt? Raising her eyes to meet him, she tried to say it without words. Evander looked away for a moment, and when he turned to face her again, she could tell that something had changed. Had letting it out actually helped? Or had he just locked it away again? Amin wasn't sure. Thank you for listening. His voice was soft, barely more than a whisper, and she could tell that he meant it. I've had all of that chasing me around in circles for months. It feels good to say it out loud. To finally tell someone. It wasn't your fault, Evander. Even if you'd been there, I don't think you could have saved them. You probably would have died too. You're still here and you remember them. That's all we really are in the end. Just memories. We're never truly gone until we're forgotten. I don't think any of them would have blamed you. Maybe you survived for a reason. I needed to hear that. I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're right. A part of them survives with me. And now with you too. Thank you. Your words mean more to me than I can explain. You'll find, Doyle. She assured him with conviction. When you do, I'll hold him. You punch him. The Canary Cage Inn, Minton, the 10th of October. A fist wrapped around Amin's lungs and squeezed. She was suffocating. The hallway was too small, too tight. She needed to get outside. Taking the narrow stairs as quickly as she dared, she crashed through the heavy wooden doors at the bottom and out onto the cobbled street. She ran like she was being chased by a rabid bloodhound. Out of town into the surrounding farmland, pushing forward over soft earth and dead leaves until her burning muscles wouldn't carry her any further. Slumping breathlessly onto a fallen oak, she dropped her face into her hands, allowing the fear to take control. Slowly, but surely, everything returned to normal. The pressure in her chest and the shaking subsided as cold air filled her lungs. The sky was a lifeless grey and a fine mist clung to everything. Tears and cold sweat mingled with the drizzling rain as she stared out over the dreary landscape, lost in thought. The dream still lingered on the edges of her consciousness. It was more than a dream. She knew that as surely as she knew her own name. There was an unshakable certainty that something terrible was approaching. Something dangerous, and it terrified her. Now that she'd calmed down, She knew she'd made a mistake. After everything, lying to Evander again had been a difficult decision to make, but it had felt like the right thing to do, 
because over the last few months he'd made so much progress. He was almost unrecognisable from the broken man she'd first met. His hollow features had filled out. There was a new luster to his long curls and bushy beard. The haunted look in his eyes was mostly gone now, and the moments of darkness in which he found himself lost inside his head were becoming less and less frequent. He seemed lighter on his feet and recently he'd been wearing an ever-present smile that reached his eyes even if it wasn't on his lips. It had been so good to watch his spirits rise, especially over the last few days, and the last thing she wanted was to drag him back down, but was that her decision to make? Shouldn't she have told him everything? At the end of the day, a lie by omission was still a lie, but she'd needed space and time to think, to work out what it all meant. The man with his unyielding eyes boring into hers. Dark days ahead. His voice had boomed all around her as a thick spray of dark blood spilled from his mouth and coated his chin. The shadow, reaching out and swallowing the sky, getting closer like a bird of prey swooping in. The jagged fissures that had formed in the earth and spread towards her. Blood had poured out of them turning the green grass a rusty red and forming thick pools with figures contorting within them. That was the part she hadn't told Evander because she knew what it would mean to him. There was a night, not too long after Celeste had been killed, when Amin had been visited by their mother. At the time she dismissed it as grief and nothing more. There was no great beyond, no better place. There was life and then there was death. That's what she'd always believed. Even after that day, she'd tried to convince herself that there was some logical explanation. But seeing her mother sat at the end of her bed, with so much love and concern etched onto her face, had felt so... true. It had felt the same way when she'd opened her eyes to see the man from her dream standing beside the window in their room, but not the exact same way. Where her mother had radiated an energy that Amin found warm and comforting, the man burned with a razor-sharp fury. He felt dangerous, but somehow Amin knew that his words had been a warning, not a threat. The solid, observable reality that Amin had always known had slammed into a world she didn't quite understand. Evander had been right. The story he'd told her that night in the cave had been insane. Vengeful spirits, dark omens, and a man who should have died but didn't. The problem was, there'd been no hint of a lie in his words, and she believed him. Now, more than ever. There was no way around it. Whether she wanted to or not, she had to tell him everything. It wasn't her place to decide what he was strong enough to handle. The streets were busy by the time she trudged back into town an hour later, and the mouth-watering aroma of freshly baked bread, warm pastries and cinnamon rolls from the Hardwell family bakery made her stomach grumble. Checking her pockets, she groaned as she found them empty. With a frustrated sigh, she turned and weaved her way back towards the canary cage to collect her coin pouch. The crowd parted as a horse-drawn coach emerged from the swirling mist ahead. People whistled and waved their greetings, and Amin observed their enthusiasm with fascination. If this was who she thought it was, then the one they called Boss Man had returned from his business. Interesting. She'd been eager to put a face to the name, to see if the man lived up to the hype surrounding him, but her stomach gave another insistent growl as she watched the coach trundling towards the town square. Bossman could wait. For now, it was time to grab some food and find Evander. Morning, a man called as they crossed paths. It was Baxter, and she groaned inwardly. Offering him a small wave, she powered ahead. Bax was nice enough, but she definitely wasn't in the mood to talk to him right now. Tired, cold, and hungry was not a good combination, and she just didn't have the patience to deal with him. Their room was empty when she arrived, but Evander wouldn't be hard to find. If he wasn't downstairs getting food, he'd be putting himself to work. Busy minds create busy hands. 
That's what Celeste used to say, and Avanda had one of the busiest minds of anyone she'd ever met. Give him any more than half a second to himself, and he'd be a million miles away. Lockbury had been a mess. Drawn far too much heat. They'd kept their heads down for a while, until hiding away had made them both restless. When Avanda had finally suggested moving on, Amin had been nervous. They were wanted. Somebody could turn them in. In the end, they'd agreed to move about, never staying in one place for too long. But Evander wasn't content to be a casual observer, and they'd ended up doing odd jobs and small favours everywhere they went. Amin leaned heavily upon the dressing table, palms down, as she gazed out of the window over the rain-soaked landscape to the Brathwell farm in the distance and the new barn they'd helped to build. Minton had rekindled a fire inside Evander, and it burned brighter every day. Having a community around him again had been good for him, giving him something to live for. It was unfair that the dream would come to her now and threaten to disrupt everything. Shaking her head to dismiss the niggling worry, Amin grabbed her coin pouch and headed for the door. Oi! Special delivery, said Amin twenty minutes later, nudging Evander with her foot to get his attention. A smile of pure delight crossed his face as he looked up from the wagon he was inspecting to see Amin's arms laden with brown paper bags. This one's just for you. Hope you're hungry, she smirked as she handed him the largest bag. Mrs Ardwell thinks you're too thin. I've been given strict instructions to fatten you up. She says she can't bear to see an hard-working man go hungry. Personally, I reckon she just ate you and she's trying to feed you to death. Wouldn't be hard at this rate, he somehow managed to say through a mouthful of carrot cake. I'm telling you, I mean, there's magic at play. He paused to swallow and wiped his mouth on his sleeve. One day, people will come here from all around the world just to get their hands on Mrs Hardwell's legendary baked goods. Children will tell tales. Fights will break out over who gets the last slice of cake. That's if there's anything left for anyone else, which there won't be if I have anything to say about it. I've never met anyone so passionate about cake, Amin teased as she perched on the wagon to devour her own food. It really was good. Mouthfuls of pure bliss. Market day had arrived, and she watched people flock from stall to stall as she ate. Bargains were being hunted, and deals were being struck. Everything, from fresh fruit and veg, preserves and hot food, to handcrafted trinkets, weapons, clothing and livestock were on offer. Despite the buzz of excitement, a nervous anticipation filled the space between herself and Avanda, both of them knowing they needed to talk, neither one wanting to be the first to go. Come on then, Amin sighed, after swallowing the last mouthful of warm, flaky pastry. I'll help you finish up here, and then we need to talk about it. The square was heaving with people by the time they were done, barely enough room to move. The din of so many voices clamouring to be heard was getting a bit ridiculous and slightly overwhelming. Taking a step back to inspect Mr Fullman's earthenware display, Amin nodded her approval. Mr Fullman bellowed his thanks as he passed them both a handful of coins. Evander offered him a cheery wave as they walked away. Bumping and barging their way through the tightly packed crowd wasn't easy, and Amin sighed with relief as they reached the far end of the square and turned onto Wollstone Street. As they walked, Amin tried to assess Evander's mood, but his face was impassive. Not a good sign. When he was relaxed and happy, Evander was easy to read. It was when something was on his mind that he became stoic and quiet. After a few minutes... They found a bench beneath the golden brown canopy of two birch trees and sat side by side. The street was quiet with most people at the market and a tension rippled between the two of them. Evander stared down at a cracked cobblestone, rubbing a thoughtful hand through his beard before turning to face Amin with an expression that made her instantly nervous. I've been thinking, he said seriously. Amin's pulse quickened, her mouth dry. This isn't going to be good. When you told me what you saw this morning, it felt familiar. Like 
you were describing one of my own dreams. We can't know for sure what it meant, but my instincts are screaming at me, I mean. I don't know how, or why, but I think it had something to do with Doyle. I'm pretty sure it did, she told him quietly. I wish it didn't, but I saw the ground bleeding and I don't know what else that could mean. I didn't tell you earlier because you've been happy and I don't want this to fuck it up for you. But that's not how it works. You've got every right to know and if something's coming you need to be prepared. Relief flooded her system as Evander nodded his understanding and took her hand softly in his. I already know what you'll say. But this is important, he said with a solemn expression. I know how you feel about what happened when we first met, but the way I see it, you did the right thing in the end. The road ahead is dangerous. I don't even fully understand what I'm up against, but I won't turn aside. I can't. Sooner or later, the gods will bring Doyle and I together. What happens after that is anybody's guess. Maybe I'll find a way to stop him. Maybe I won't. Either way, one of us will die. You gave me a choice, I mean, and now I have to do the same thing. If you want to walk away now, I won't blame you. I'll understand completely. This isn't your fight. You have no skin in the game. And whatever you might think, you don't owe me anything. You don't have to allow yourself to get caught up in all of this. A wave of anger washed over Amin. Why did the world have to be like this? Evander was so sure that his gods had a plan, but if that was the case, she hated them. It was cruel that things had to play out the way they did to bring the two of them together. She knew that wherever he went, Evander would always walk in the shadow of Valdus Doyle. She got that, respected it, but there was no way she was going to let him face it alone. I'm not going anywhere, she said simply. I know you're not. His smile was warm, but his eyes held a half-hidden fear. Amin squeezed his hand and shuffled along the bench towards him. Whatever happens now, I made my choice, she told him firmly. You gave me the chance to walk away and I made my choice, just like you did. She brushed a loose curl from his solemn face. The look he gave her triggered a chain reaction and suddenly she couldn't help herself. She leaned in and their lips met, soft and gentle, hesitant at first but deepening quickly. His fingers traced delicately along her wrist and up her arm, the sensation causing her pulse to quicken eagerly. For a few seconds, nothing else mattered. This was exactly where she wanted to be. Resting a hand upon his chest, she savoured the moment, taking the time to commit every detail to memory. The spell was abruptly broken by the sound of a nearby cough, and Amin groaned inwardly as she pulled away. Evander's face was flushed, and she resisted the urge to lean in again. A tall brunette stood a few feet away, looking uncomfortable. I'm sorry to interrupt, it's just the man would like to see you, she said awkwardly. Right now, if that's convenient. No problem, said Evander with a puzzled expression. Just lead the way. Without a word, the woman turned and strode quickly up the cobbles back towards the square. Talk about bad timing. Amin had been wondering if she'd get the chance to meet Bossman for days. She wanted the chance to figure him out, but not right now. We're not done here, she told Evanda quietly. I'd be disappointed if we were. We should probably try to focus right now, though. Yes, serious business. Off to see the mayor. Worst timing ever. Will you stop it? You're going to make me laugh and we need to make a good impression. The brunette cast a quizzical look over her shoulder at the two of them, and Amin waved to show that they were still coming. With a great effort, she locked the last few minutes away for later. Evander was right. This was serious business. Time to focus. 
Bossman's office was quietly fancy. It was neat and tidy, subtle hints of ginger and vanilla hung in the air. The pale autumn sun peeked in through a large window, soaking the room in its soft amber glow. A well-stocked bookshelf ran the length of one wall, a map took up another. The man himself was sat behind a walnut writing desk that was polished to perfection. He was lost in thought, eyes scanning some sort of document as they took their seats across from him. Time ticked by as he kept on reading, never sparing them so much as a glance. The short, stocky stature, clean-shaven face and salt and pepper hair was not what Amin had been expecting. The image she'd built up in her mind was of an imposing, bald-headed, rough-and-ready type, a grisly powerhouse rather than a baby-faced intellectual. Just as Amin was starting to feel impatient, he gave a quick nod and put the document to one side. Opening a drawer, he pulled out a cigarette and a box of matches, lit up and leaned back in his dark leather chair. Here's a funny story. You'll probably enjoy it. I did, he said, shrugging casually as he looked between the two of them. Couple of months back, I'm up in Lotbury and I hear about this right ruckus. Big deal, it was. See, two members of the Queen's Guard, they get knocked out by these outlaw types who nick off with their gear and crash a public execution. Got away with it scot-free and all. Left a right mess. The powers that be, they ain't happy, are they? Nah, mate, course not, cos it don't look good, does it, when two people can make the entire town guard look like a massive bunch of useless twats. Pretty embarrassing, really. Shit. Amin clamped down on a sudden surge of adrenaline. Evander remained unmoved, but she could feel a tension in his leg as it rested against hers. She nudged it gently, trying to signal that they should stay calm. Bossman regarded them both evenly, smoke drifting lazily around him. Didn't think anything of it at the time, he mused. Nah, didn't pay that much attention because I don't really give a shit. Not my business, is it? Got more important stuff to be getting on with. So it goes to the back of my mind, and I forget all about it. Anyway, I get back from my little business trip today, and I hear about some new faces in town. That's surprising, that is, because we don't really get visitors round here, but you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, do you? Dead nice. That's what everyone says about them. Really helpful. Can't sing the praises enough. I talked to Mrs Hardwell, done her, because she's a good un, and I always stop in on her after a trip. Home comforts, in it. Can't beat them. She's right taken with these strangers. Tells me all about how they ran a delivery up from Brathwell Farm for her. Says they've been coming in every day, which is good, because she thinks the bloke's too thin, but I just laughed at that, because Robin thinks everyone's too thin. It's the same with everyone I talk to. Now but good words to be said, and I'm thinking... I've got to introduce myself. But then for some reason, out of nowhere, I start thinking about Lockbury. And BAM! The crack of his palm against the desk was unexpected, but they gave him nothing. If he wanted to rattle them, he'd have to try harder than that. Amin was dying to look at Evander to gauge his reaction, but now wasn't the time. Boss man knew who they were. That much was clear but they'd already be on a prison barge if he was going to turn them in. No, he wanted something. But what? Keeping her breathing steady and her expression neutral, she waited for him to just get on with it. I've heard all about you, mate, said Bossman, with a finger levelled at Amin. Oh yeah, you're a bad un, Amin Barrett. At least that's what the law says, but that's a bit black and white, isn't it? Bit simplistic. See, that's the thing, I'm all about the nuance, me. Minton's a great place to hide out, right on the edge of the kingdom, away from prying eyes. No one gives a shit what goes on out here. Not right now, anyway. The thing is, I know what you're about and what you do. What I don't know is why. It's a right dangerous business, robbing from the crown. They're absolutely itching to get a noose around your neck. What I'd like to know... Is why you did it in the first place. I mean, don't you think he's got an interesting name? 
Evander cut in. What I'd like to know is, who called your boss man first? Was it you, or them? Now that is a good question. Boss man turned his bright, chestnut eyes on Evander and gave him a broad smile. I like it, because it cuts right down to the core of my character, doesn't it? What kind of man am I? Do I command respect or do I earn it? That is a razor-sharp question, mate. Well done. Sorry to disappoint you, but it's fairly simple, mate. No big mystery about it. My dad was mint and born and bred. Lived on a farm just outside of town as a kid. Dirt poor he was, but he didn't let that stop him. Ambitious he was. Big dreams, that man. He met me mum up in Lockbury, and she moved out here to marry him, which her folks weren't best pleased about. But he gave her a good life, worked his fingers to the bone. In the end, he ran that old mine before it got shut down, and the workers called him boss man. The way people round here see it, it was me dad what looked after him when the Great North Canal rendered us fucking useless and the Crown forgot all about us. When he died, too young I might add, People started calling me boss man as a sign of respect to him. Makes me old mum smile too, which is nice. I don't feel like I deserve it, to be honest. I'm not even half the man he was, but that's not up to me. I've just got to live up to it and hope that one day it feels like I've actually earned it. I think we all have someone we want to make proud, said Evander earnestly. Amin nodded in genuine agreement. That hadn't been the answer she was expecting. Gazing out of the window at the bustling market below, she considered the question that Bossman had asked. I did what I did because I wanted to help, she said. Her mouth was dry and the words wouldn't come easily, but she forced them out anyway. I wanted to be like your dad. I wanted to look after people. That's what I told myself, but it was bullshit. It was personal. I wanted to help, but not as much as I wanted payback for my sister. I was being selfish, and I did a lot of shit that I regret. I'd like to say that I've moved past it all, but I haven't. I hate them, and I just can't see that being something that I'll ever let go of. I respect that. Honesty. Self-reflection. Can't have been easy to say, but... It was what I was hoping to hear, said Boss Man with a warm smile. We've got a friend in common, me and you. Mr James Wilcox is my cousin. We're not that close, but we do have a good catch-up whenever I go up to Lockbury. Gives me all the gossip, doesn't he? That's how I heard about you two. He said you were right down the line. When I realised it were you in town, I was hoping he was right. I won't doubt him again. They like you round here. You made a good impression. As far as I'm concerned, you're welcome to stay as long as you want. You'll have no trouble. The sun had crept a little further into the room now, and the tension in the air was gone. There was a strange expression on Boss Man's face as he lit up another cigarette. Amin thought there was an ambivalence in his eyes, as if he was fighting with something. Emotions bubbling to the surface before being snatched back. They sat in silence as he weighed up whatever decision he was trying to make, and then his face turned serious. I've got plans. Big things come into this region if I play me cards right, he told them quietly, as though still unsure of himself. I'm currently in negotiations with two other towns, Tunstall and Clearwater. Tunstall's right out on the southeast border, built upon the GNC near the Queen's Reservoir. There's a Queen's Guard outpost there, and the captain, a bloke by the name of Malford, is a right bastard. Walks round like he's Billy Big Bollocks, treats the town like it's his causes all sorts of trouble. His boys follow suit, don't they? Of course they do. High-ranking officer like that, setting a bad example. What else are you going to do? The ground's got its eyes set on expanding into the southeast, and the QGs are stationed there as scouts. A couple of months back, James gets a placement there, and we've been keeping in touch. According to him, they want a town built on the coast within the decade. They've recently made an official declaration of intent, The Queen's graciously allowing one year for a challenger to appeal, and if no one speaks up, the Northern Kingdom gets a whole new county to play with. It's a sham though, innit? There's no one down there with enough power to stand up to her, so it's a done deal already. Clearwater's about a day's ride outside the current border. I reckon they're going to do quite well for themselves once they become our newest neighbours. 
They're in a prime location. Big river that cuts right down to the coast, and a forest not far away. The mayor of Tunstall's a good mate of mine, and we figure it's better to show Clearwater some friendship now. Mutually beneficial, isn't it? Between the three towns, we've got fishing and farming, lumber, coal and clay easily available. If we can form a working relationship that's ready to go when the expansion happens, I reckon we can turn this region into something special, instead of just being the forgotten arse end of the kingdom. Now they were getting to it. The dancing around was out of the way, and he was finally ready to cut the shit and get to the point. Whatever it was, Amin could tell it was going to be big. He was clearly building up to something. Bossman was leaning forward with his elbows resting on the desk, and there was an intensity in his eyes now. Amin wasn't sure what to make of it. Where's this going? What do you want? Sneaking a curious glance at Evander, she saw him listening with rapt attention. His face was impassive as he ran a thoughtful hand through his beard. Is that good or bad? Things are going well. We're getting close to a deal. But Clearwater's having problems and they've asked us for a favour as a sign of good faith and all that. Bossman continued. The QGs have been using Clearwater as their own personal playground. They go down there to unwind and have a bit of fun, don't they? They've been intimidating locals, picking fights, destroying property, all sorts of nasty business. They've even been stealing from them and calling it a preemptive tax. According to James, it's all being spearheaded by Malford because he thinks he's untouchable, but he ain't. Nah, mate, because his big ego's been ruffling the wrong feathers in Albra, and one big fuck-up could see him thrown out on his arse. For this thing with the three towns to work, Malford's got to go. So where do we come in? asked Amin, although she thought she already knew the answer. He wants us to take the fall for whatever scheme they come up with, said Evander with a cynical smile. Minton and Tunstall can't be seen to get involved in case it blows up in their faces, but we've already been named enemies of the Crown. It's not going to get any worse for us. They already want us dead. If we agree to be scapegoats, everyone else gets to keep their hands clean and clear water gets what they want which gets the Alliance off to a good start. It's a clever plan. I'll give you that. You know what, mate? I'll arc you, said Bossman, with a deferential nod to Evander, but there was a hint of some indecipherable emotion in his eyes. Straight to the point. No nonsense. I respect that. I'll spare you the bullshit sales pitch. I want this partnership to work, and Clearwater wants Melford gone. It's non-negotiable. If, and when, he gets the boot, he'll be replaced by a two-star called Roberts, who by all accounts is a much more agreeable bloke. The Crown might not give a shit about us right now, but that means we get left alone, and the last thing I want is to be the one that draws unwanted attention this way, if things go pear-shaped. Sort of defeats the point, doesn't it? I've been trying to wrap my head around this for weeks, but I hadn't a clue how to get it done until today. I'll level with you. You're right on the money. With the position you pair are in, I need you. Amin sat quietly for a moment, mulling it all over. Part of her was pissed off. Despite Bossman's warm smile and friendly demeanour, all he really wanted was to use them. At the same time, that made sense. It was logical. He was clearly an idealistic man, and maybe his big dreams were just pie in the sky. But if this partnership was as promising as he seemed to think it was, then Amin could see how much it could help people in the long run. Getting involved was dangerous, but it was also tempting. Bossman was right, they were in a unique position. The ground already wanted them dead, and wasn't it worth a bit more heat if it gave the three towns a chance? Amin thought it was, and she suspected Evander would probably agree but this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction sort of thing. They needed to take the time to think this through, needed to be cautious, rather than blundering in on an impulse. We're going to need some time to discuss this, said Evander, and Amin offered him a thumbs up under the table. It's just not a decision that we can make lightly. I'm sure you understand. If he doesn't, he can find someone else to be his patsy. Yeah, of course. It ain't something you can be hasty about, I understand that, Bossman agreed, as he checked an ornate-looking pocket watch. 
We should probably wrap this up now anyway. I've got another meeting in about 20 minutes. Let's get together in a couple of days and you can tell me where you're at. If you're in, we'll iron out the details. Until then you can do what you like. I'll have a cab take you back to the canary cage if you want. They politely declined his offer, choosing instead to walk back through the bustling streets in the dappled light of the autumn sun. Amin's mind was churning as they strolled along in thoughtful silence, with life unfolding all around them. A family happily sipping hot drinks at an outdoor cafe, a group of gangly teenage boys kicking a ball between them, a wagon driver roaring impatiently at a bunch of nattering old-timers huddled together in the middle of the street. There was no way of knowing for sure what Minton would become in the future, but Amin could see its potential and felt that it could be something special. Whether or not they chose to get involved in Bossman's little conspiracy, she hoped he could deliver on his promises. He was a strange man. Amin wasn't sure whether or not she liked him, whether she trusted him or thought that he was full of shit. Either way, they'd probably find out soon enough. There was a chill in the air by the time they arrived at the canary cage, and Evander immediately got to work lighting the fire in their room. Amin felt her mind begin to wander as she watched him. He looked good, with his loose curls dangling over his face, and the sleeves of his dark red shirt rolled up to the elbows. When he turned to face her, opening his mouth to say something, she gave a little shake of her head to stop him. Not now, she told him quietly, as she used one of his braces to pull him closer. Their lips met again, but this time there was an intensity to the kiss. It deepened as Evander wrapped his arms around her waist, pulled her tight against him, slid a hand up her back and into her hair. She lost herself in the moment, the rest of the world falling away and leaving just the two of them. She bit his bottom lip gently and then pulled away with a suggestive smile. I told you we weren't done, she whispered in his ear. Everything else could wait, they could talk about it later. For now, Amin wanted to make up for lost time. They should have done this weeks ago.